Amen. The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord forever. His praise will ever be on my lips. What a wonderful opportunity to praise the Lord tonight. Stand with me, they can and will. And we're going to magnify the Lord and worship God in spirit and in truth. Father, we're blessed and thankful for this good evening in the Lord. And we thank the Lord for your bounty and your blessings. Touch this service tonight by your anointed presence. I pray the spirit of the living God on our worship upon everything that's said and done. Give glory to yourself as we edify the saints of God. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Doctors don't have the final say. Amen. Amen. John, you had a request. Well, Pastor, you know how the enemy hits us hard. So I have a friend. Right now he's staying in Card City with a pastor. Helping him every way. He's married to this lady. And this just happened weeks ago and the enemy's hitting him. Now she's throwing divorce at him and going after a while. He only has some vehicles. He has good money. But uh, she's saying things that are not true. So the enemy is attacking Jeff. His name is Jeff Wolf. He's a good brother. And I want to ask for that the Lord would help him as much as possible. Amen. Pastor Jeff, yes. Debbie and I just heard from our daughter Lexi.
I want to start by addressing a couple of things. So I'm glad you're here tonight so I can address you. And uh, I've had people tell me, well, Pastor, why in the world do you want to talk about the book of Revelation? So I want to answer that question tonight. Why study the book of Revelation? I believe we've never had so many sources of breaking news beamed at us nonstop every day. I can't turn the television on. I, I go to YouTube. We don't have cable, so I go to my YouTube channel. And every place you look at, there's another um, crisis going on. And genuinely, they are crises if you look at them. But most of those stories leave me a little perplexed. Perhaps you too. Definitely disheartened. Who can imagine times like this? As somebody asked me the other day, did you ever think we would see something like this? And I have to tell you, so a few years ago, I've been, I've been, I started, uh, preaching through the book of Revelation uh, in the 90s, because it was an interesting book. And that's why I started preaching through it, because I like the book. And uh, it's, uh, if you haven't read the book of Revelation, I would encourage you to read it. If you expect it to fall into place like you read it, it's not going to happen, because it's not written chronologically. There's a lot of parenthetical uh, chapters that are in there that take some explaining. We'll do that. But I started looking at that, and uh, it just intrigued me. And so I really didn't think at that time we would ever see what we were looking at in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Even four or five years ago, I was questioning, well, this doesn't seem possible. Now I'm looking that it looks very, very possible at this point that we're, we're going to see some things. Uh, but who could abandon those kind of things? The political upheaval, I had never seen in all of my life, I'm not a political person, uh, and I'm not an old person. <laughs> but I've been around a little while. And I have never seen politics like we see it now. It's almost a deadly sport. <laughs> I mean, Indeed. I've never seen such disrespect. I mean, we would never talk to someone in authority like that, even if we don't agree with them. And let me, let me say this right off the bat, maybe he's not your president. You, you can live with that, and that's all right. We've already discussed this a few years ago. We don't talk politics in here because some of you can't handle it. <laughs> so, but I have never heard such adversity in all my life. Uh, one political party against another, and one person against another. It's almost amazing. Uh, global terrorism, we see it all over the place. Mass killings, rogue states, economic peril, rampant secularism, worldwide pandemics, racism, division, war. I, I, I will tell you this. And I, I'm going to go ahead and hit the elephant in the room for a moment. I am from the Deep South. I understand what racism is. And there's not a racist bone in my body, but I have seen it all of my life. But never did I think I would see what we're seeing now. Destruction of property. I better stop right there. But let me tell you, earlier generations could really only imagine these days as they read the concluding book of the Bible. Now we're living in those times. Those times that epitomize the contents of this prophetic book. It is the only New Testament book of prophecy. There's nine prophecy books in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. Uh, uh, 
25% of all scripture is prophecy. You need to be reading and studying prophecy. You say, well, I don't understand it. Well, that's why we do it here together. Will you understand? Do I promise you'll understand it? No, because I don't understand it. Excuse me for licking my finger. I can, you can't. <laughs> there's, there's a sponge there, but it just, it ain't the same. <laughs> But I want to show you how the writer of, of the book of Revelation envisioned what we're talking about. I don't feel frightened by the coming apocalypse. I'm not afraid, and neither should you be. If we know Christ as our Savior, we should be exhilarated by the times as they unfold. We should be able to say, wow, it's closer than we thought. This is what we're living for, church. We're living for this. We've been living for this all of our life. How many people have we have, have we won to the Lord, Pastor? How many people have you brought to the Lord with the, with the thought of, yeah. if you accept Jesus Christ, you're going to go to heaven. Yeah. He's just about ready to get a load up. <laughs> and we're going to go. God's given us... <coughs> This book of promises and insights called Revelation. Because he wants to reveal tomorrow to us today. The key thought in Revelation is simple. God has a plan for the future and for eternity. Regardless of what happened, no matter how depressing or difficult the news, life in Christ has a happy ending. Amen. For those names who've written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. So we understand there's going to be things that overwhelm us if we look at it. I look out at things going on and i got to be honest with you, I have to take a step back every now and then and say, Lord, what in the world is going on? He usually says, you don't need to know basis. <laughs> you don't need to know right now. But there's simply something special about the book of Revelation. It's the only book in the Bible that promises a special blessing for those who study it. In fact, I'm going to show you during the process seven different blessings that are promised to you that look at the book and examine it and love its message. If you need an extra blessing from God today, you'll find it in the pages of the book of Revelation. See, we've read it from the wrong end for so many years. We've read it from the frightened end. We've read it from the, oh, I don't want to know that end. I'll, I'll tell you in a moment why people don't study it. Um, but there's also something powerful about knowing the future. You ever wish you knew what the future held? You ever said, said back then, I wish I knew that back then. I wish I'd have knew in 73 what I know now. Man, how wealthy I would have been. I would have begged, borrowed, and stole, a, bought shares in Walmart. Amen. And uh, I would have been on Easy Street. But little did we know. But I want to take you through some of these events, chapter by chapter. You see, from the dawning of history, Men and women have dreamed of foretelling the future. And the devil leverages that desire. He's enslaved millions of people through astrology, fortune telling, gambling, and the occult. They all want to know the future. Man, if we knew the future, we could pick the right lottery numbers. Of course, none of us in here buy lottery tickets. I understand that. But... If you knew what they were, you might. But the writers couldn't foresee how modern technology would unfold. We, we, we often try to, I mean, I know that there are people that tell you they know the future. Now, you can surmise some things, but only God knows the future. Amen. We don't need tea leaves. 
We don't need to become sci-fi fanatics or look at crystal balls to know what's coming. We can look in the Bible and it tells us clearly what's coming. And I think it's important that you know what's coming. And uh, let me say this from the beginning of the study. I am approaching the book of Revelation with a pre-trib rapture mentality. Now you might not believe that, and that's okay. I, honestly, I hope you're wrong, and I hope I'm right. But just in case, I want you to know what's going on. Revelations should motivate us as we study, study it to rearrange our priorities. We should step back and say, this isn't so important after all, or this is more important than that. Uh, it will help you to understand what life is really all about. We talk about that uh, often. When you learn about the rapture of the church, the unleashing of the tribulation, the unfolding of the last days on planet Earth, the rise of the Antichrist, the courage of the tribulation martyrs, the power of the heavenly angels, the return of Jesus, the great white throne judgment, the nature of hell, it's all covered in Revelation. You're looking at the endless realms of heaven. When you look at all that, you're going to see your present life more clearly. It's in there. And can I say something to you? Um, if John 3.16 is real and true, and I believe it to be. Amen then every word in this book is true. You can't say, well, that's, I don't believe that. Don't matter what you believe. Somebody says, well, uh, you know, the Bible said it, and I believe in that settles it. No, don't matter if you believe it or not, it's settled. <laughs> if the Bible right, says it, it's settled. That's right. And it's going to happen. Imagine if you knew the stock market would collapse tomorrow. <laughs> or Los Angeles would suffer, suffer an atomic attack. Or a new Disney theme park would open in our city. It would affect your emotions, your plans, your priorities, the things you talk about uh, today. It would overshadow your communication. We view our lives today more clearly when we have an insight into tomorrow's events. Well, the book of Revelation gives us that perspective. But there's more to it than just that. As you study the book of Revelation, you're going to see, I believe you'll worship Jesus in a fresh way. You see, in the Gospels, we see him as a friend of sinners. And that's why he came. He came to save the lost, to save the world. We see him as the Savior that died and rose again for our sins. In the book of Acts, we see him as the unstoppable force behind his church. In the New Testament letters, we have a better understanding of the mission of Christ and bringing justification to the world and the nature of his person and work. We learn about the privilege of being in Christ. All those are true, and that's a wonderful thing. But in Revelation, we see something different. We encounter Christ as a faithful witness, as the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the one who was, and is, and is to come, as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who is holy and true. We see him who holds the seven stars in his hands, who opens doors that no man can shut. We see him as King of kings, Lord of lords. Forever and ever, he says, Amen. With the description of Jesus in Revelation, as we study these 22 short chapters, I think you'll see him in a new appreciation and adoration. I think the book of Revelation, one of the reasons we study is it infuses us with a new sense of urgency. 
Again, I've been studying Revelation for years. I don't completely understand it. I know more about it today than I did yesterday. But I haven't learned it all. And you know, the Bible says that you know we're like iron that sharpeneth iron. We come together that we all uh, could could learn. And so you have things to share with me. I have things to share with you. You have insights to share with me. I have insights to share with you. Some of us have to unlearn some of the things we've learned. Again, as I started really getting into this, I was, I was pastoring a church, and I had a lady that was teaching our Wednesday night Bible study. And she was had a Church of Christ background. Anybody here in Church of Christ? Don't, don't want to offend you, but their eschatology is a little off. And uh, we sat there, I sat there the first night, and I'm kind of thinking my head a little bit. Wait, I'm a new pastor, I can't say anything yet. So we went through that night, the next night, they, the next week's night, we started in, I told Donna, I can't just sit here and let this go on, because she's teaching wrong theology, wrong eschatology. Mm -hmm. And so I, she said something, and I corrected her, and then... I could see that she was a blonde. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But I only say that because you can see the the skin color change against the backdrop of blonde. I could see her face getting red. And I'm getting deeper. And so she continued to teach something, and she was wrong on that. I said, wait a minute, let me say this. And I could hear her puff a little bit at that point. And I thought, I'm going to stir a, a pot up here in a minute. So she said something else that was wrong. And I corrected her. She finds the pastor, maybe you need to teach this class. I said, I think you're absolutely correct. I'll start that this next week. I got up finished that night, and I politely removed her from the class. Because she simply was teaching incorrect theology. Uh, and like I said, I don't know it all. I never claimed to know it all. Um, and, and you know, it's, you know, I won't say what I was going to say. But the book of Revelation gives us an urgency. And when I was going through that, I got a brand new realization that Jesus is coming soon. Well, he didn't come then. I mean, actually, I begin to think he's coming at any moment, and I still do. But he didn't come then. A few years ago, his prophecy began to pop back up, and uh, all of a sudden, people were teaching it again. Uh, there was a new uh, a resurgence of teaching on prophecy, and we had everybody out there telling us the, about the blood, uh, red blood moons, and uh, we actually even took a field trip. One was it Wednesday night? Yep. After church, it was still light, and it was on a blood moon night. We went up on the on a, towards Virginia City and uh, watched the watched the the blood moon come up that night. Kind of interesting. I believe there was an airplane that came over the top of the hill that night with its lights on. We thought it was Jesus coming. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody drunk no. We had, we had a few visitors come by that night. Very interesting. But it was a great time. And we really, all of us felt like his coming was so soon. Well, when you study it again, I want you to see he's closer now than he has ever been. Amen. His coming is closer closer now than he's than it's ever been. Um, we're still here waiting. But the times are more urgent and the events of Revelation nearer than ever. Again, prophecy is one of my favorite subjects. Why? Well, it reminds me, time is short. There's souls to be saved. There's so much for the to do for the Lord. People are in pain today. 
You look around and people are wor worried, they're panicked. They're concerned about their future. We want to be able to rescue the loss and see that approach. And we see the approaching of that coming night. The writer said, he that's got ears to hear, let him hear. That's how we feel as we study the book of Revelation. Times are urgent, the days are short, and the battle's fierce. The book of Revelation is a shield for our heart. If we study, we'll know better how to escape the coming darkness and anticipate that great day for the Lord. I'm praying that God gives us ears to hear during this study. He gives us mouths to share the message of Revelation with others as we wait the greatest breaking news in human history. One day the paper is going to read, he's back. We don't know anything about it, but he's back. I don't know what CNN will report. <laughs> they won't. Let me share another couple things with you. And the first thing you want to do when you start, we're going to go through a, a little quick outline of the book of Revelation. But why is the book of Revelation so unpopular? Why do pastors shy away from it? Why do teachers shy away from it? Why do people in the church shy away from it? How many has ever read the book of Revelation? Most of you have because uh, we went through the whole book. <laughs> Well, let me give you a few reasons why it's unpopular. First of all, because prophecy has been so abused. It's been abused by false teachers, by date setters. Part of the reason that many feel this way is because there's so many religious crackpots out there. I'm, I'm not going to name them. I couldn't name them all, you know. But, you know, we have people like Harold Camping. Um, Weiner, Weiner, what's his name? Weiner Stample, Weinhart, 88 Reasons. Oh, no, Weinhart. Yeah, something like that. Brother Weiner Head, or whatever. <laughs> Anyways, he said there's 88 Reasons why the Lord was coming in 88. He didn't come, so he wrote another book. 89 reasons why he's coming in 89. <laughs> Got a few more million. <laughs> but it's amazing the false teachers that are out there. And, and uh, you know, they make ridiculous claims about prophecy. So people say, I don't want to hear about it. Don't bother me with that. It's not going to happen like you say it's going to happen. It's never happened like that. Well, you're right. It has not happened like many have said it's going to happen. But I keep reaching down for it. It's going to happen like he said it's going to happen. Amen. There's no doubt about it. And so that's why people don't want to look at the book of Revelation. Second reason is it's hard to understand. That's what people, that's an excuse. How many find Revelation hard to understand? Sure. You know? Um, it is one of the most difficult books in the entire New Testament. And it is, without a doubt, the most controversial book in the New Testament. There's so many different ways to view the book. Christians ha have some heated debates on this book. You and I can sit down, and I promise you, we can find a spot in the book where we disagree. Amen. Even conservative Bible-believing Christians have different views on the book of Revelation. It's a book written in code. It's a book that's full of all kinds of strange visions and weird symbols. So it's hard to understand, so that's why it's unpopular. 
Third reason is because much of the book is very disturbing. When you read it, it's very disturbing. The book doesn't end on a positive note, or excuse me, the book does end on a positive note. No sin, no sickness, no death, no tears, no hunger or thirst. Satan's cast in the lake of fire. That's great. That's good. But man, you got to go through 21 chapters to get to that. Of uh, pure hell on earth. God wins in the end, but a lot of the book is very alarming, if not even depressing. Another reason it's so popular is it has all these natural disasters. The, the book talks about, Revelation talks about the sun turning black, the moon turning red, describes all kinds of divine judgments, such as 100 pound millstone falling on your head, plagues, earthquakes, famines. Who wants to read about that? Who wants to be a part of that? It's also a very violent and bloody book. Wow. Number four. It mentions a third of the sea turning into blood and a third of the earth burning up. It mentions not only wars on earth, but wars in heaven. And we've seen that in Star Trek and all of these other things where, but you're reading about it happening in the book of Revelation. Not just wars in heaven among people, but also among angelic beings. Revelation is a war book. In fact, and I had the word written here in Greek, and when I printed it out, my computer didn't have the correct font, evidently because every, I got one letter and then two question marks, two letters and three question marks. So I, I, I don't know how to say that in English. But it's a word for war, the Greek word for war, and it's used 15 times in the book, and only eight times the rest of the New Testament. So it's really a war book when you think about it. The book of Revelation talks about war more than the rest of the New Testament put together. So it's a kind of a, a frightening thing when you think about it. Very violent. Some of the book is kind of gruesome. Bob talks about believers that are martyred. Talks about the Battle of Armageddon. There's actually four four prophetic wars that haven't happened yet. And they're going to happen. There's the Psalm 83 war, the Ezekiel 38 war, Gog and Magog. There's Armageddon. And then there's Gog and Magog too. That really messed me up when I when I read about Ezekiel 38, and then I read Revelation talking about Gog and Magog, until I realized it's talking about two different wars. So it's not a hard thing to understand. You have to put it in perspective. But the Battle of Armageddon produces a river of blood that's over 200 miles long and five foot deep. A river of blood that long and that deep. At the end of the battle, it describes that. In fact, an angel invites all the birds to come and gorge themselves on all the dead bodies lying on the ground. That's in 19. The wicked are thrown alive into the lake of fire. That's pretty gruesome. Now you don't want to hear anymore, do you? And there's no rest for them day or night for the victims. Chapter 14 and chapter 20 talked about that. So I ask the question, why should we study the book of Revelation? What is the value in studying it? I'm glad you asked. First of all, because the book is inspired by God. Amen. Revelation 19 and 9, 
You read it. 21 and 5, 22 and 6. It's part of the Bible. It's the Word of God. So God wants us to know it. You need to read, study, and preach the whole counsel of God. Amen. You don't just take a chapter out because you don't agree with it or it's too hard to preach or it, that's not a pleasant thought. You preach the whole counsel of God. Amen. This book is inspired. John wrote the book, but he didn't write down his own ideas and thoughts. It was revealed to him by Jesus Christ. John was taking dictation. Put, put uh, chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 1 up, brother. Just for a minute. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, things which must shortly come to pass, he sent and signified it by the angel unto his servant, John. John didn't write. In fact, go to the next verse, brother. Who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ of all the things he saw. Next verse. Let's see, he that readeth, he that hears the words of, the, of this prophecy, and keep things, uh, keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. I'll hold off on that. But John was writing down what he saw, what he heard, not what he thought. He didn't get in a closet and write a, his memoirs. He, didn't, he wasn't sitting down writing, you know, uh, a fiction book. The Lord was revealing it. The messenger of the Lord was revealing it. So he was re uh, he was writing what was revealed to him. But how was it revealed to John? Well, it was actually a four or five stage process. God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to an angel. That angel was, well, we don't know, know who that angel was, but we know at the end of the book, John tried to worship that angel. The angel gave it to John. John wrote it down and gave it to the seven churches, who in turn gave it to us. It's quite a process. Now, we're not going to get into this, but there is a little debate on which John this was. Um, I do believe it was John the Apostle. Um, the author is simply called John. There's several names in the New Testament for, the, for John. But early on in church history, of the second century, scholars settled on the idea that it was written by the Apostle John, who by this time would have been in his 90s. You can't have a ministry late in life. In his 90s, he's writing the greatest book that, that, that we would read. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Some, some preachers say it means that the book is about Jesus. It's an unveiling of Jesus. No. That sounds good, but... And there, in fact, are about 34 titles of Jesus in the book. Faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth, the lion of the lamb, the son of man, the word of God, uh, Lord of Lord, king of kings, Alpha and Omega. But that's not what it means in its context. This is pri not primarily a revelation about Jesus. It's a revelation of future events. Things which must shortly take place. So it's the revelation of Jesus in a subjective sense. Now, I've had some people say they don't like studying prophecy. Well, you need to be studying prophecy because, like I said, it's a fourth of the Bible. If you don't study prophecy, 
you're taking away 25% of the Bible. So you need to know what prophecy says. You can't study the Bible without studying prophecy. See, when Paul begins talking about the rapture, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Many Christians are ignorant of Bible prophecy. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want you to be, he doesn't want us to be ignorant about it. Often we hear people say that we should not teach young Christians prophecy. It's going to confuse them. Save that for the more spiritually mature. Not, well, haven't met a whole lot of those. But, but it's better to give them more simple truths, they say, in the Bible. How to live the Christian life, how to pray, how to witness, how to read the Bible. Well, is that a valid point? I bet you're thinking that's even a trick question. Paul was in Thessalonica for just a few weeks. The book of Acts chapter 17 tells us. He formed a little church there. He left the area and wrote two letters back to the church. And then those letters, he talks about the rapture, the first resurrection of the dead, the second coming, the Antichrist. They were young Christians. And he wrote to them about that. Why? Because Paul knew prophecy was needed for new Christians. It's also needed for us. Again, the reason we study it is because it occurs a special blessing. It's the only book in the Bible that carries the blessing for those who read it. No other books, the 66 books of the Bible, none of them contain a promise like this. This, this group is a promise of blessing because we will be studying, or this group we're in tonight has that promise of that blessing because we're going to study the book. You're going to be blessed. I remember reading about a man who deliberately read the book every six months to make sure that he didn't miss out on the blessing. I don't say you have to do that, but I think you need to read the book. Now the blessing carries three, is in three stages for three things. First of all, for reading the book. Then for hearing the book read. And then for obeying what the book says. Now the blessing goes from reading to hearing for a reason. It says, he who reads and they who hear. Why did he say that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because not every church had a copy of scripture. In fact, this book wasn't even around at the beginning of the church. But usually the church had one copy of the scriptures. I remember going to Mas Masada and uh, off of the temple they have a room where they keep precious papers and they all temples have them. They keep books and special papers and writings. And archaeology found a page out of the book of Jeremiah in that room that read verbatim of other copies, proving how accurate it was. But they only had one copy of the book. And so they would read that to the congregation, for lack of a better term. Some could not read. So they needed to hear the word. Printing presses hadn't been invented yet. They were they didn't have a Bible like we have. Every, every home's probably got a Bible. If not, we try to get one to you. And I probably got thirty to forty different versions of the Bible. But in John's day, most Christians didn't have that luxury. Prophecy is designed to make an impact on our lives. It's designed that we're blessed 
the same Greek word used in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes. He talks about the uh, blessed are the poor, the spirit, blessed are the meek, so on and so forth. There are nine Beatitudes in Matthew. According to the book of Revelation, there are seven Beatitudes. And you're blessed even when you read it. And Revelation opens with a blessing, and then it ends with a curse or a severe warning. This is a book that can be understood. Don't ever sell it short. I can't understand this book. And everything that was, it can be understood. It was written to be understood. Back to verse 1, brother. To show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. He wants to show the servants. Notice he didn't say, I'm going to show the theologians. I'm going to show just the rabbis. And they'll, no, I'm going to show it to the servants. Who's the servant in here? Amen. He wants you to see it. He wants you to understand it. And uh, so it can be understood. It's not hiding, but it is a revealing. The word revelation actually means an unveiling or an uncovering. This book is not hidden. It's actually uncovering something. It was meant to be understood. Uh, the very word means disclosure. It means that he wants to disclose something to us. In fact, the book is not sealed in, in uh, verse uh, 3, I think, brother. That's not the one I wanted. But he tells us, well, it was back in verse 1, in fact, where I told you he's going to show his servant. He's going to show his servant. He's not going to hide it from you. He's going to show it. He also tells you in the 22nd verse, you see the book of Daniel, which was a precursor, as it were, to the book of Revelation. God told Daniel to seal it up until the end of time, or time of the end. He said, shut it up, seal it. But now Revelation says, it's time to unveil it. It's not sealed. The book is not intended to be a riddle or a puzzle that no one but the sharpest minds on the planet can figure it out. But i got to tell you, I'm not the sharpest mind on the planet. But Jesus says, Revelation from Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants, not his scholars, but his servants, what soon must take place. It's not just a book of prophecy, or a book for prophecy freaks, or for seminary professors, but it is for all Christians. Now, there's parts of the book that's going to be hard to understand. There's probably going to be parts of the book that you and I are going to disagree on, and that's okay. You can disagree any time you want. Well, it will be without a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but you're welcome to disagree. Uh, but I know there's parts that's hard to understand. But I would be lying if I said everything in the book is easy to understand. I would not be telling you the truth. So we're going to take a pretty long stroll through the book of Revelation. And uh, if this is not for you, you're welcome to bow out of the Wednesday night study. And if we're right about the book of Revelation, you may never be back to the book. Just tell you with this. Just say it. So what is the key to understanding the book of Revelation? How can I understand it? Some believe that the Bible's last prophetic book is closed, meaning that no one can understand it. But again, I showed you the key verse. He said he wants to show his servants what must come to pass shortly. Those are that, That's a key word there. I hang on to that word shortly. Now the Father gave to Jesus to, uh, something to reveal, 
It was a key not to hide, but to show it. And the book's last chapter, God reiterates that his words were given to reveal, not to be sealed in 22 and 10. He says, seal not the sayings of this prophecy, of this book, for the time is at hand. I want to catch that phrase. Because I believe the time is at hand. Daniel told him to shut it up and seal it until the time of the end. He said, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Uh, of course, we are there. Uh, the key to understanding the mysterious book of Revelation is comprehending the story flow. The theme of the book of the uh, is events leading up to Jesus' second coming. Understand that. Um, I shared here the other day the difference between the rapture and the second coming. But to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand that everything is leading up to his second coming. When he returns to the earth, again, um, the book second and third chapters contain vital warnings to seven churches that existed in Asia Minor, and I'll be talking about them kind of in depth. Now many believe those churches represented Christian churches from the time of Christ to the end. It's actually right into actual churches that were there. There are more churches than just the seven. But he's addressing seven churches that had different spiritual problems. So many believe, and a lot believe this, that it was that it not only represented the seven churches in Asia Minor, but different churches throughout different stages of church history. But also it um, had a representation to believers, different believers, different uh, groups of people. Now you see, how can that happen? Let me tell you, and I've told you this, uh, that there can only be one, you can write this down, there can only be one correct interpretation. There's only one. But there may be many applications. You have to understand that. How does that apply to me? How did it apply to them? How does it apply to me? How does it apply to today's church? You'll see a lot of churches in this, today's churches in what we're going to study about. Um, the word revelation comes from the word apocalypse. Uh, which means revelation or uncovering or disclosing something. He said things that must shortly come to pass. Now when you think of that word shortly, many of us think about what's oh, going to happen soon. That's not what this word means. It actually means swiftly. When it starts, it's going to happen very rapidly. That's going to be the shortest seven years you'll, you'll have ever known. If you think this year has gone by fast, uh, he said, these things are going to take place shortly. They're going to occur swiftly when they start. Now, there are, there's a threefold division. One of the keys to it is understanding that. He said, well, Revelation 1 and 19, right? Things which thou hast seen, things which are, and things which shall be hereafter. So, things that thou hast seen. The past, things that are, which are, the present, things which shall be hereafter, the future. So he's talking about the past, the present, and the future. And this is the only book in the Bible where the divisions are given, and uh, they are given by Christ himself. He said, those things that thou hast seen. The vision of the Son of Man in the midst of the seven lampsticks. He said, I was in the Spirit, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. So after giving us the purpose of the book and the greeting, John tells us that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You might refer to Saturday or Sunday, but it could have been a deeper implication about being taken forward in time to the day of the Lord. 
We don't really comprehend that part. John hears behind him a great voice. It sounds like a trumpet. Before we go on to read what John saw, let me review the truth revealed in those first ten verses. Just hang on for just a second here. Some of the fundamental Christian truths that we see in those ten verses. Verse 1 tells us that there was a prophecy about future events. Verse 1 tells us that Jesus was given his revelation by the Father. He thus was not all-knowing as a man of flesh because he limited himself to his brain uh, of flesh and what the Father revealed to him. God was revealing it to the Son. Jesus and the Father could not be the same person speaking. This, this is, that speaks of a very, very important doctrine, if you can catch it. That's one of the greatest Trinity scriptures we will see. Verse 2 says, John says in a more record of the Word of God, and that John in his gospel tells us the word he bore record of was God, and, that, and this God dwelt among us in the body of Jesus. Another one hard to understand. But speaking of the fact that Jesus was God. Now, I'm not going to get into the study of the Trinity, because that's going to lengthen the study by two years. Yeah. <laughs> and then we still won't understand. You know, some things are are not taught, they're caught. You have to understand by faith things that happen. I, some things you're never going to get in this feeble little mind because we look at it through, the, through our eyes, through our mind's eye. And we're just human. We're flesh. And uh, so it's a lot of times it's hard for us to realize when Jesus told Thomas, you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Because we're one. It's hard to understand that. Because we look at it, wait a minute, there are two people. Uh, are you confused yet? Verse 3 teaches the prophecy of Revelation is ongoing with the church. Verse 4 says that God always exists. Uh, again, verse 4 tells us about the seven spirits before the throne. Now, what are the seven spirits mentioned in the book of Revelation? That expression, seven spirits, is found only in the book of Revelation. And, it, and it's only found four times in the book of Revelation. Um, chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, John, to the seven churches in our nation, grace to you and peace uh, from him who is, was, and who is to come, from the seven spirits that are before his throne. Again, he says in the third uh, chapter, verse 1, the angel of the church of Sardis write these things, saying, the, uh, says, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works and I, I have given you a name that you are alive and you're dead. Verse, uh, chapter 4, 5. Verse 5 says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings, voices, and thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And there were seven spirits of God. Chapter 5, verse 6. And I saw the midst of the throne of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders. A lamb standing as though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, and seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. Now, what in the world is he talking about? The common view is it, it, it will be thrust out of this argue, out of this article, to look at the case of the seven spirits. We're going to do that, but it's, it's, it's symbolic as a reference to the Holy Spirit. The number seven corresponds with the Hebrew word, uh, meaning to be full, abundant. It's found 56 times. I'll share the word with you uh, when we get to that point. But it's found 60, uh, 56 times in the book of Revelation, 88 in the New Testament, and it's a number represents perfection. So when we think of the word seven, many of you think of that as a word complete. So it is a complete, it is complete, it's the completeness of the spirit. The plural form of the spirit, spirits, it says, might suggest the diversity of his powers. 
uh, his ministry within the seven congregations that were selective were illustrated of his uh, of his purpose. In verse 4 and 5, it makes clear that God is a triune being. Sound of the Holy Spirit, seen through the seven characteristics of the Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 also tells us that Jesus was the first to rise from the dead and that he would not die again. Verse 5 tells us salvation comes from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 tells us believers will become kings and priests. Verse 7 says that Jesus is physically coming back. Verse 7 also implies that there will be a judgment at his coming. Verse 8 tells us that Jesus is God Almighty and the beginner and the ender of all things. Uh, verse 9 implies that the Christian will be in the tribulation while we're in this world. Not the tribulation, but we'll have tribulation while we're in this world. Verse 9 says that Christians are brothers and companions in the kingdom. Verse 9 again tells us that the kingdom is not yet on earth. Jesus is patient, not willing that any should perish. Verse 9 indicates John's place of exile, the Isle of Patmos. Verse 10 is that there is a day called the Lord's Day or the Day of the Lord. Now the Day of the Lord is a special term. I'm going to quit in just a minute. It's a special term in the Bible used to refer to a period of time when God uh, directed, directly intervenes in human affairs in judgment and blessing. The Lord uh, uh, we will uh, that we're presently waiting for in our time uh, begins with the rapture, the translation of the church, and will continue through the uh, tribulation period for seven years, and it's on through the thousand year reign on earth. There's a time of the new heavens and the new earth. Verses 13 and 15 through 15 describes the Son of Man in the midst of the candlesticks. Uh, the Son of Man is a name that Jesus often used for himself. That literally means Son of Adam. The picture is one that portrays the glorified Son of Man uh, in this verse. That's what the Savior looks like now. Think about this. His head and his hair are blind, blindingly white. His eyes like fire, his feet like brass. He's no longer known after the flesh. The clothing and girdle, uh, the golden girdle indicate that his person is a, is, is a high priest. The voice of Jesus is not like a natural voice when he speaks. He roar, roars like Niagara Falls in John's ear. The candlesticks, the golden candlesticks and seven stars. Um, the explanation of the stars, as with many of the symbols of Revelation, is given in the context of the passage where it occurs. So you see that you don't understand it. Well, it's explained there in the, in the passages in which uh, it occurs there in verse 20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest to my right hand, the seven gold, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are, uh, which thou sawest are the seven churches. The seven stars are the messengers of those churches. So it's not hard. And then again, verse 16 and 18, continue reading that John was... Uh, saw that uh, John saw a being controlling the seven stars uh, in his right hand. He later be told that those stars are angels, are messengers. Out of the mouth came a sharp two-edged sword that indicates he spoke the word of God, Hebrews 4.12. Uh, being not only had a white head, but he also was blinding like the sun. When John looked at him, he fell on, his, fell on his feet as dead. I would like to think that we would learn that John's spirit was actually there. Uh, his being, he was there in person. We know that he was translated. 
he was there, but he actually was, he actually touched, he was actually touched by the bee, and he was raised up. So he was there. He wasn't just having a vision. Some people think this was, this was a bad dream he had. Oh, he was there. Obviously, John didn't know who he was seeing. John was afraid that, uh, and he became like a dead man. He just laid there. He was playing possum. He, he didn't lace, that, that being lays his right hand on John, tells him, don't fear. And John apparently gets up. Why don't we stop right there tonight? And uh, we'll pick it up. I'm just doing a real quick flash drive through here. Uh, and then uh, we'll get a little bit, we'll slow down a little bit later and take some things into in concert with what we're talking about. And uh, but we need to quit at 8 o'clock because the kids are full of pizza and <laughs> in the home. So another grab chocolate and so Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus. God, we understand and we know that you're in charge. Father, we look at all these things and we begin to investigate them. It's not a frightening thing, but God, it's, a, it's, a not, it's an enlightening thing. God is a, let's just realize the urgency of the time we live in and the exciting times that we live in. Father, help us to understand where we are in church history. And Father, just about to reach Revelation 4, chapter 4, where you said, come up hither. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we know we're close to that promise. In Jesus' name, keep your hand upon us and save. We praise we leave this place. Amen. God bless you, Lord.